This is the modern epidemic, and it's as misplaced and it's as fictitious. This is the plague of ADHD. Now, this is a map of the incidence of ADHD in America, or prescriptions for ADHD. Don't mistake me here. I don't mean to say there is no such thing as attention deficit disorder. I'm not qualified to say if there is such a thing. I know that a great majority of psychologists and and pediatricians think there is such a thing. But it's still a matter of of debate. What I do know for a fact is it's not an epidemic. These kids are being medicated as routinely as we had our tonsils taken out. And on the same whimsical basis and for the same reason, medical fashion. Our children are living in the most intensely stimulating period in the history of the earth. They're being besieged with information and calls for their attention from every platform, computers, from iPhones, from advertising holdings, from hundreds of television channels. And we're penalizing them now for getting distracted. From what? You know, boring stuff <laughs> at school for the most part. It seems to me it's not a coincidence totally that the instance of ADHD has risen in parallel with the growth of standardized testing. Now, these kids are being given Ritalin and Adderall and all manner of things, often quite dangerous drugs, to get them focused and calm them down. But according to this, attention deficit order increases as you travel east across the country. People start losing interest in Oklahoma. (laughs) They can hardly think straight in Arkansas. And by the time they get to Washington, they've lost it completely. And there are separate reasons for that, I believe. (laughs) It's a fictitious epidemic. If you think of it, the arts... And I don't say this exclusively of the arts. I think it's also true of science and of maths. But let me, I say about the arts particularly because they are the victims of this mentality currently, particularly. The arts especially address the idea of aesthetic experience. An aesthetic experience is one in which your senses are operating at their peak. When you're present in the current moment when you're resonating with the excitement of this thing that you're experiencing, when you are fully alive. An anesthetic is when you shut your senses off and deaden yourself to what's happening. And a lot of these drugs are that. We're getting our children through education by anesthetizing them. And I think we should be doing the exact opposite. We shouldn't be putting them asleep. We should be waking them up to what they have inside of themselves. But the model we have is this. It's, I believe we have a system of education that is modelled on the interests of industrialism and in the image of it. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, schools are still pretty much organised on factory lines, so ringing bells, separate facilities, uh, specialised into separate subjects. Um, we still educate children by batches. You know, we put them through the system by age group. Why do we do that? You know, why is there this assumption? that the most important thing kids have in common is how old they are. You know, it's like the most important thing about them is their date of manufacture. You know what I mean? Well, I know kids who are much better than other kids at the same age in different disciplines. You know, or at different times of the day. Or better in smaller groups than in large groups. Or sometimes they want to be on their own. If you're interested in the model of learning, you don't start from this production line mentality. These are, it's essentially about conformity, and increasingly it's about that as you look at the growth of standardized testing and standardized curricula. And it's about standardization. I believe we've got to go in the exact opposite direction. That's what I mean about changing the paradigm. It's Nina Infinity. Welcome to Breaking the Narrative. And tonight we'll be breaking the narrative on education, the education system. Where are we at now? The clip that you just saw was from about 10 years ago. So things have changed, especially in the last two years. 
kind of drastically with regards to the new COOF guidelines, what teachers have to go through, CRT, all that kind of stuff. So kids are being bombarded from all angles, from from very different uh, things. Suicide rates are going up. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to unpack tonight. And I'm so happy to be joined by my panel. Script Doctor, how are you tonight? I'm very tired, but I'm very excited to be here. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad that you're here. Do you want to tell everyone where they can find you before we start? They can find me mostly conscious here right now. Uh, I apologize. I've been up since 5 a.m. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, it's all good. Um, uh, but I'm on Twitter at Script Doctor PhD. I also do have a, a YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash Script Doctor. And you can also find me back here on Nina's channel on Sunday nights where we will be continuing our review of uh, Marvel's What If. Absolutely. And that was a fun show last time, too. Um, uh, Ms. Martin Muses, hello. How are you? Oh, doing good. Thank you. Thanks for being on. Uh, I'm so happy that you're joining us uh, because I don't know if a lot of people know, but I know that, you know, you used to be a teacher and uh, your uh, opinion is, is very valued today. Um, so thank you for being here and uh, please tell everyone where they can find you. You can find me at Miss Martin Muses uh, here on YouTube where I talk about what makes me laugh, makes me cry, makes me happy, makes me sad, or just really ticks me off and Twitter to underscore Martin. Excellent. And uh, Jane, Jane, how are you, Jane? I am fantastic. Happy to be here. Yay, I'm happy you're here. Please tell everyone where they can find you. Yeah, you can find me here on YouTube where I post movie and television reviews and occasionally some pop culture commentary. You can also find me on Twitch, Twitter, and Instagram at Jane Theory. Excellent stuff. And everyone's uh, YouTube and Twitter is in the description down below. So please make sure you're subscribed and follow everyone, especially on Twitter, because social media, as evil as it is, that's how we keep track of where everyone's streaming at, you know, at, at a time. And uh, so if you want to be aware of where your favorite streamers are, please uh, give them a follow. Uh, Deranged Lunatic, thank you so much for the $1.49 super sticker. It's a rose. It's a rose. Thank you. It's your cousin, Teresa. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that uh, was an I, I think that was a really interesting start um, in terms of uh, where uh, how the education system is designed to, to begin with. Um, so, like I said, that video, which is also linked in the description. So you can, if you guys want to watch the full thing, is in it's in the description so you can access it. Um, it's it's designed uh, on this it, uh, on this kind of like factory uh, prison system where everyone's lumped together in a, in a certain certain group based by age uh, and things like that. And uh, that's how we, we got educated. We were all educated in this system. And uh, that's where we're at now in terms of like the, the, the kids who have grown up now are sending their kids to school. Uh, so I think that's like a really interesting to, thing to think about. Uh, before we get into all of this stuff too, by the way, none of us here are medical experts. Uh, let me just make a disclaimer here. None of us are medical experts. We're not psychologists. Uh, I'm very fascinated by psychology, so I read a lot about it, but I'm not certified ther therapist or anything like that. So just be aware of all that. So if we're talking about masking or jabs, especially for kids or whatever, do what you need to do um, that is the best thing for you and your family. Okay. That is, has always been my point of view. I'm not here to advise you to do anything or not do anything medical. Okay. We're just having a discussion about all of this, which, which I think is important. You have to have civil mm -hmm. discourse when it comes to this kind of stuff. Uh, so uh, with that being said, uh, let's begin uh, by talking about how uh, right now, at, at where we stand right now, uh, in terms of uh, what the coof has done, uh, it, it's 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 some tragic stuff has come about. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of kids that are being uh, incredibly affected by what's happened. Um, this here is uh, from AMA, uh, and AMA adopts a policy to address increase in youth suicidal and save lives, uh, suicide and save lives. 
Uh, according to the recent Center of Disease Control, the CDC study, there was a 31% increase in the proportion of mental health-related emergency department visits for youths aged 12 to 17 years during, the 2020, during 2020 as compared to 2019. Particularly concerning, CDC data also showed increased rates of suicidal uh, uh, ideation and uh, suicide attempts in 2020 during the COOF pandemic as compared with 2019 rates. Given these staggering statistics, the AMA is publicly calling attention to the escalating crisis in children and adolescents' mental health in the U.S. in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic and has adopted policy aimed at addressing the serious health concern. We are deeply concerned by the dramatic increase we are seeing in youth suicide and suicide risk even before the mitigation measures and disruptions caused by COVID-19 pandemic. As a nation, we must do everything we can to prioritize children's mental, emotional, and behavioral health as a step up our efforts to prevent suicide and mitigate suicide risk among, among our nation's youth, said AMA board member Willie Underwood. Uh, physicians play a vital role, and we must ensure that physical uh, physicians and uh, see youth patients, not solely uh, uh, pa pediatric uh, psychiatrists and, ad and addiction medicine physicians have the ability, cap uh, capacity, and access to the tools needed to identify when a young, per uh, young person is ex experiencing periods of imminent risk and uh, and ha help prevent suicide attempts. So this is this is something that is definitely very concerning. And um, Teresa, please share some of your experiences when you uh, when when this whole coof thing hit. And uh, you were in school, you were a teacher. Um, what did you experience uh, when, when, when that happened? Wow. Well, t two things happened. One was our workload doubled because we had to teach in school and also teach an equal amount outside of school on a computer. And so it was like doing a two full-time jobs. Also, um, we had a, a lot of the restrictions put on, like, you know, the children had to sit absolutely still. They had to, you know, put the masks on. They weren't allowed to play together. They weren't allowed to sing. They weren't allowed to do a lot of the things that are really, really important for little children. I'm going to say they weren't allowed to play together. They were allowed to play together, but, mm -hmm. you know, they usually it, you'll go into a healthy kindergarten class and there'll be like a carpet and the kids will all be lying down. They'll be reading books to each other. They'll be sharing because that's one of the things that's really important for development for little children, mm -hmm. um, as well as things like singing um, because it's just something that just comes natural to them. Mm -hmm. and, and it's also a great way to socialize and group games are very important at that age and mm -hmm. all of those were taken away from them. Yeah, uh, yeah. The idea of like the whole uh, social referencing thing—that's uh, that's another uh, big thing, a big mm -hmm. part of especially younger children, uh, like babies and like preschool uh, learning, uh, and the idea that uh, when parents and uh, their peers, like teachers, wear masks, that they can't, uh, you know, touch the face and see their expressions and learn through that. So studies are just starting to get released about how damaging it is to kids uh, who are experiencing this kind of learning and, well, lack thereof, like actually not experiencing it. Um, so uh, did you have any, did you have any kind of like what what year school were you teaching Teresa? Oh I'm gonna keep it kind of vague. I mean I think okay. I've kind of given it away that I've definitely worked with children, young okay. young children. So they uh, were younger. Like they weren't like teenagers. No, no, I no, that's not my clientele. No. Okay. Um yeah. Ele elementary age, uh, I guess is close enough. Okay. Uh, elementary to middle school age is is a kind that I worked with and uh the <sighs> The joy, uh, the joy of what you would do with them just was gone. Um, you know, you do your best. I mean, I really did my best to show my expression with my eyes and my hands and mm -hmm. puppets and all sorts of things to try. And they did, you know, I think it was a miracle what teachers did pull off. Mm -hmm. 
people don't know what we went through. And a lot of teachers had nervous breakdowns uh, within months of doing wow. it. Because well, also not only because we had this incredible stress on us. And remember, it's stressful for us to wear uh, masks all day. And I don't care what anyone says. You're not getting the a lot of oxygen, and you're being covered up, and you're claustrophobic, and you, um, you, your workload is just doubled. And the the mandates that they also put on uh, for teachers, they never give them assistance. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's just like here, do this, double this job, but we're not going to give you any help. That's crazy. Yeah, um, the, the government loves to make mandates, but they don't actually give us what we need to carry it out. I should also share that I'm I'm also actually a certified teacher, uh, and so is my husband. So uh, when we actually moved to Mexico, my husband was teaching English as a second language um, uh, to to uh, to Mexican kids here. And prior to 2020, every time he would go to school, every single time. He would go to school, he would go and get sick, and he would bring it to the house, and I would also get sick. It was a thing. It happened every year. And I just feel like this whole thing about now with regards to wearing masks or whatever, I just feel like it's just blown so out of proportion because that was every year we experienced that. Did you guys not get sick? Like, did you, have you been around kids? Like when they go to school and they come back and they get you sick? I don't, I don't well, know. Well, I was, that. I was teaching at a private college as a professor. So no, I didn't get sick. Oh, <laughs> oh so, yeah. You get sick. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I mean, as adults, they, they tend not to get sick as frequently as kids. Cause they, they just, kids just do some more stuff really <laughs> with each other to, to allow for viruses to, to spread but um mm -hmm. no why i remember when my my godchildren all seven of them were going to school those first three four years were, were a nightmare um because they just they caught everything <laughs> like, everything mm -hmm. i remember like just hosing one of them down in, in in the early um spring just because they got sick so i just got the hot water and i just put it hooked up to a power washer and just hit him with it uh <laughs> he had a blast um wow <laughs> But uh, yeah, like I, I, I was a very cavalier uh, godfather. <laughs> I, oh my I, goodness. What about you, Jane? Have you ever had that experience where like, do you have any kids around you? No, no, but I do know, you know, they, kids can be disgusting. I mean, yeah. as, as we've yeah. learned, so can adults, apparently they don't always wash their hands or know how, but um, it's, it, yes, in, in that particular environment, especially considering everything teachers already do to try to um, basically keep kids from getting sick from one another, keep themselves healthy. Mm -hmm. um, that can be incredibly stressful when you're also at the same time being told, oh, but there's this other thing out here that's incredibly dangerous that can make you sick or family members of yours who are more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, but I think too, part of the problem, everybody talks about the stress of 2020, the stress that was on the kids, the stress that was on the teachers, the stress that was on the parents, um, the stress that was on society. But you also have to remember that a lot of that was a product of the politics of the time mm -hmm. because you're being told on the one hand, there's this pandemic, there's this thing happening. We don't quite know what it is. We don't quite know how extreme it is. We want you to stay home. Mm -hmm. But you people, you have to go to work. And we're not going to try to help you. We don't have anything in terms of PPE because that's all in China or wherever, <laughs> but good luck. And at the same time, we want you to handle all these other consequences of your being out there in the middle of all of this. There was never a point at which the country actually took any aspect of it seriously. They should have been prepared. They should have had everything they needed for the population. What they didn't have, they should have been able to create to, mm -hmm. to I don't know what you have to do to get companies on board with making stuff, but all of that should have been a part of some sort of plan for something like this to happen. And people should never have been rushed back into the workforce to begin with. If this is what you're telling us we're facing, there mm -hmm. shouldn't have been this level of stress because people shouldn't have had this much stuff on their plate in the first place. Either there is a pandemic that we're having to deal with or there isn't but you can't have this compromise of both. And the only reason you did was because of politicians who had to have their own particular take on what was happening and use it 
to get votes, period. Kind of like an a la carte crisis. Exactly. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, I mean, that's fascinating stuff. But I mean, when has that, when has the government ever been prepared about anything? Like, when has any petty been prepared about anything, really? I mean, but it's, like, the it's, but the problem is that they've had a, they've had a hundred years ago, we went through the same thing. Yes. So they yes. had plenty of time. They had between then and now to be prepared for. They have now until the next time to be prepared for. And what are they doing? Nothing. Well, it's, it comes down to the hu hubris of people and also the incompetence of those that wish to pursue public office. Um, that That's just the, the matter. We, we should always be very, very scrutinous uh, with regards to the people that are running for office because of the responsibility that they have to their constituents. And mo some sometimes, I mean, I, we probably all vividly remember the mentality at the time where uh, I just want to vote for someone that I could sit down and have a beer with was basically the minimum requirement uh, yeah. that a lot of people had, which is, is not very good for, for society as we've seen. Um, the other part too is that, yeah, like uh, the organization and the desperation of, of, of these of people just in general, uh, you can go back to one of the biggest um, educational crisis was the baby boom. Mm -hmm. um, they knew it happened. And they had five years to prepare, and none of the Western world really did. Classes were overcrowded. At that point, I think the average class size was like 21 to 23. And then that ballooned up. And then when they had kids, and then the next generation had kids, the average class size in the 80s and 90s was 32 to 35. And I think it's kind of flattened a little closer to that in recent years. But I know I know that they're pushing the 40 Um I think they're, class? yeah, they're about 40, 40 to 45 now uh, in some places. But I, a, a lot of the private schools are still at around 30. Yeah. But the public ones are. And 40. the question you have to say is, well, I mean, one out argument is that, oh, we just need more teachers. It's like, perhaps, but you need teachers that are qualified and good teachers. And that takes time. That's and if you have me. a whole, and if you have a whole bunch of teachers applying for jobs, and you don't have the time to vet them because you've got the school year quickly approaching, you're just going to grab the one that you think is kind of best or makes a decent, good impression, but not, but very true, but ugh, excuse me, but might not be very good at executing the job. In which case you're actually making the problem far worse than you are better. <laughs> That's definitely true because finding a good teacher is like finding a good, uh, what's it called? Um, Mechanic. mechanic yes <laughs> yes absolutely true. uh you don't like they're rare uh i'm sure teresa is a good one teresa when i saw this last year i couldn't help but think of you oh um, yeah i yeah that was ridiculous uh, i'm not gonna play the whole thing but just so you guys see this this was the uh are they playing was, living in america i don't know <laughs> i don't remember what they're i think they're playing schoolhouse rock I'm not sure what they're playing, but this was probably one of the saddest thing I've ever seen. Oh, um, you know what I would have done if I was a student in that class? I what? would have uh, hooked up a little air compression to make it look like the tent was sucking in on itself as the air was going in and out of my instrument. Mm -hmm. Just to yeah. freak people out. Just to freak people out. <laughs> there was another one too I remember from last year that I saw, and I was like, "This is kind. Of, this is like the end times here. Like, what are we doing with our lives? Like, wh why?" Uh, this was like a uh, this is like a dance in this in the school and they were like doing the social distancing dance back to uh, how are you supposed to get knocked up that way this is this is fucked up <laughs> i was like what that is really bad i mean the best part of dancing is looking into your partner's eyes this is the kind of stuff that drives me nuts like just and they all have masks on and it's just it it's, <laughs> It's that chaperone just, is freaking out. Yeah, yeah. it's just <laughs> unbelievable. Like some of the stuff that that you would see, and that, and that's you know, that's not even that's not even that upsetting because they're older. But when you see stuff like this, you know, you're like, maybe I should homeschool my kids. And uh, I know I know homeschooling is is got a lot of uh, extra. Uh, <laughs> To go with it but and we were having a really interesting conversation in the back about that um but what do you guys what do you guys think when it comes to uh homeschooling like do you do you think that that's something that should be considered now 
I absolutely, w- I've said a long time ago though, that, you know, if I ever have kids, I'm definitely going to homeschool, but that's because of my experience in school <laughs> and mm-hmm. the fact that um, of my entire education, I maybe had a handful of what I would consider good quality teachers. For the most part, the curriculum was terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, and I went to good schools. I went to quote unquote high ranking schools in my state. And yet, um, unless you were talking about gifted or AP classes, it, mm-hmm. they sucked. It was just no point. And my parents had to supplement my education with actual facts and books with substantive material in them. Um, so I was I had a combination of home and public school education. And so for me, I just I would not trust the public school system, even if it were how it was when I grew up, um, to teach my kids and definitely not today. Yeah, but the other part we have to consider is how many parents are adequately uh, versed in, say, science, um, math, English. Yeah. No, you're <laughs> uh, right. It, 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 no. It, no, I mean, that's, that's a double edged sword, right? It's like, you know, that's the last thing we need is the blind teaching the blind, because sometimes you have parents that are like, listen, I'm an idiot, but I, I know if I get my kid to a good school, they're going to be OK. Like, that's the smartest thing that they have on their within their parenting reach like they know their morals they know how to keep their kids safe clothed fed but if they came to, a, to them with like a, a simple math problem before that common core stuff ex- existed oh. they'd be like ah, i wish i could help you son i really do <laughs> or i wish i could help you little girl my girl but i but you know they're just not there so they would hire a tutor or something of that nature to to you know assist um well, that's I was also yep. going to say the way that actual home, a lot of homeschools do work, especially once they get to the older grades, they actually uh, they actually form co-ops. So, you know, that they go almost like in these little groups and yeah. have different um, like different parents. Like if one is with history, one does this, one does music and the like. So they do share between the different ones because, yeah, it, it doesn't always necessarily work. Mm hmm. Yeah, and my it, friend is a um, history teacher, but he's a history teacher as a tutor. So he he mm-hmm. basically, uh, I think he charges five bucks a head. It's mm-hmm. uh, fifteen kids. It's uh, three days a week, and he teaches them history. And they go on. Well, before the pandemic, they went on trips and they got interactive stuff, and it was like a couple hours a day, and it was a really fun thing. And mm-hmm. um, when the pandemic hit, he obviously he couldn't do that anymore, but he he likes doing that because. It was the kids were of whatever age that the parents wanted. And it was kind of like an, an elective course that you would take in university, uh, like in that type of attitude, like you didn't have to do that. But he reached out to a bunch of parents and schools and he used to be a teacher in the school system. And he's like, yeah, I just don't like the um, don't like the boards of education that he has to work for. So he wanted to work on his own and he maintained the curriculum and he was able to address all the kids and he had a lot of fun. and. Uh, yeah, hopefully he starts that up again. But th- those are good options too, if you have See, like students. That's, that's a great option because um, right now I know like I know several people who have also done similar things, especially when the pandemic did hit and especially when they had to kind of start homeschooling and they had no idea what to do. Like these parents don't know what to do because they've been working. They they trust the school system to take care of the education of the of the kids. They're not teachers. Being teachers is very like it's a it's a skill. It's a skill that you develop over time. And um, it can be very, very uh, overpowering if you're something like if you're just thrown into it, you know. But do you um, think that do you think that that's part of the problem, though, is that we've surrendered so much to government when it comes to our daily lives? Like, of course, being that's able to teach your children is something that parents shouldn't have let and go so far or let go entirely in some cases. Well, it's become so systematic, right, Jen? Right. So it's not like you're just you're just teaching, you know, two plus two. You're teaching a certain curriculum and you have to teach that curriculum in order for your kid to pass the test or whatever it is. So the reason that that suffers is because it's been so systematic that, that parents don't know how to teach that systematic way to their kids right because they're they're just they're well they're not teachers they're uh, they're doing other things they're lawyers or doctors or whatever or just laborers like the other part too is how many how many homes uh do the parents both parents have a job and are just not exactly they're just not prepared i know more parents that are better equipped to teach their children how to work at their job than they are over the basic aspects of exactly which is kind of like an apprenticeship in a way too and that's also coming back right because well there's uh, been talks of a trades gap for about 20 years now 
Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it's getting more and more and more because that's how that's how people learn. People learn by interacting with one another that it's it's a proven, uh, you know, a formula that we're now starting going, to going, going over a thousand years strong, actually. <laughs> exactly. And now we're and this is like the last two years we've, we, we've disregarded it and it's become it's becoming a pandemic. That is what's becoming a pandemic is, is stupidity and the idea that. Uh, you know, that we have to teach our kids a systematic way. And if you don't do it, then you're doing it wrong. So I, I've known a, a lot of uh, a lot of people who were desperate. They were desperate. They were like, well, how the fuck are we going to teach our kids? Because well, I'm not a teacher. Like, how am I going to do it? So they would hire tutors or like whoever else was willing to come to their house in, in the middle of the pandemic. Um, obviously, they would get tested or whatever. Uh, to make sure they're safe. And then they would come, they would spend uh, time with, uh, you know, about five or six kids. If, if they're, if they're small, if they're like toddlers, like whatever, we were uh, five or six kids. Uh, if they're older kids, you can add more students because, you know, their, their attention span is not as crazy as older kids, right? Or I mean, younger kids. So um, you, you would have a class, you could have a class between like eight to 10 students if it's older kids. Uh, but they would basically hire a tutor or two uh, to teach their kids all this stuff. Uh oh, we lost Jane. Oh, she's got uh, the the bad weather there, so she yeah, might be she's back got there. she's got internet issues. Hopefully, she'll be back. Um, but yeah, so they were having they they were doing that. So the, and I think that that's starting to pick up more and more. And the idea of like kind of like the old school governesses and au pairs and all, like people are starting to really try and get together to figure out how the hell are we going to teach our kids? Because one of these things that another thing that I saw here, and actually let me pull it up, is uh, they're starting to really think about how um, distant learning is impacting kids because because some kids do not respond to distant learning and like the the no. idea of uh, sitting behind a screen and just sitting sitting there and paying attention, especially when you're a toddler, especially when you're in preschool. Uh, these kids do not like a lot of these kids, a high percentage of these kids do not learn that way. They learn through interaction. Uh, so that's the other thing. Uh, Darius Munchausen, thank you so much for the dollar forty nine super sticker. It is what is it? What is it? What is it? It's a popcorn. I'm so glad you're enjoying yourself. That's what I'm here for. And Latino Slant, thank you so much for the five dollars. As much love to Nina and the panel. Latinos for life, absolutely. Thank you for the raid, my friend. You are absolutely awesome. Uh, just quickly here, uh, got another super chat from two dollar, uh, two hundred watt studios for two dollars. Says, "Hey, beautiful people and script doctor, uh, script doctor is beautiful too." I don't have a face, so I can contest that. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a beautiful soul. Um, and two hundred watt studios for another two dollars. Man, is there anything better than Nina Smile? Oh, that is. Keep it coming, dude. Thank you. That's sweet. that's so sweet. Uh, don't stop. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, but yeah, so the distance learning, how do you feel about this, uh, Teresa, as, as a teacher, the idea of impact, uh, the, the distance that, uh, uh, the impact that this distance learning is having on kids right now? Oh, well, distance learning should only be a Band-Aid. Uh, and, and so like we had to do that a little bit uh, bef uh, before when the pandemic started, but children sitting in front of screens it just doesn't work because all of the things that you said but even me when we would have to be in meetings because everything was a zoom meeting mm -hmm. after about 30 minutes i couldn't take it i mean i just sitting still and staring at a screen and you're not allowed to leave because that's how they know you're there mm -hmm. i went bonkers and i'm a relatively well-adjusted adult children do not have that kind of skills or fortitude mm -mm. and it's not natural to them it's not no they have to, to develop that by going to a school with a social setting <laughs> <laughs> yeah well yeah i mean and it's 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 just it's not ideal i don't know what the answer is because of the way things are right now but to go back to your question about homeschooling you know i'll always say you have to do what's best for your children you know your children better than anyone else and you know what you can provide but just consider 
the fact that ch children, it's hard enough in public school. Mm -hmm. uh, before the pandemic, mental health issues, violence of, at all ages, it's, it's horrendous. You see violence at school or inside your classroom mm -hmm. that you would never tolerate in real life. Like if in your workplace, you would never tolerate that. And mm -hmm. then you add a pandemic on top of that. The, the stress levels on children was through the roof. You do you need to do what's mentally healthy and best for your children. And I am a pretty firm believer that if we are going to be continuing this, and it looks like that's what's going to happen, at least here in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, do what you can to get your children face to face with humans. Yes. They have to be. I agree. Uh, that's yep. why I'm 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 kind of at a place where if I had children, I don't. But if I did, I would be doing some of this this you know combination co-op homeschool. Um, you know, make sure that the curriculum that they're teaching my kids is, you know, like uh, that I'm involved, that I understand what is being taught to my kids. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing that we're going to talk about is some of these curriculums and some of the. The nonsense, the absolute crazy nonsense that are that is being that is being taught. Jane, welcome back. Thank um, you. The question was because uh, we were talking about like the idea of distant learning, because like mm -hmm. how that's impacting kids as well. Do you have any thoughts on distant learning? And um, I, I think I don't really have too much of an issue. Y'all know I I love uh, technology. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, I don't have a problem with it, but I do think that there could be a better way of doing it. I, I just, mm -hmm. I feel like as a country that has the wealth that we have, we're so far behind technologically mm -hmm. um, that it, it concerns me that we don't have the capability to um, utilize distance learning, distance work and things of that nature in a more effective and productive manner. It's like Americans and children including the children are already overworked and overstressed anyway, even before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So it's like, why is it that we have the ability to make all of our lives easier and we don't utilize it? Well, the craziest thing is that before, um, uh, and before, uh, sorry, before I get into this, uh, gaming or what trademark for $2 <laughs> says, hi, Nina and panel. Hi, buddy. Good to see you. Thanks for being here. Um, before uh, like this whole COVID thing, uh, when I moved to Mexico, one of the things I was doing is I was teaching English uh, online. Um, mm -hmm. So I was I was doing the online teaching thing. And um, most of the of the kids I was teaching, I was teaching Chinese kids. Uh, I was teaching Asian kids, Chinese, mainly mostly Chinese kids. But there was a lot of distant learning in Korea, South Korea, um, as well as like Vietnam and other Asian countries as well. Mm -hmm. But the, the company I was working for was Ch uh, Chinese. And um, I, I remember at first... Uh, they had started with kind of like a one-on-one -on -one thing. And the one-on-one -on -one thing was really cool because you get to know the student and, you know, kind of like go into it and they would get used to you. And you had a curriculum that you would teach, but they were younger. So they were more, you know, they, they, they understood more and blah, blah, blah. Some kids were really into it and some kids were not. Mm -hmm. Like they, the, you could tell that they were just sitting there because they were being forced to by their parents. Like there was no other uh, recourse. Whereas in some kids like really loved it. Like they loved talking to you and like, you know, hearing about your day and learning. And you could see that they were learning, especially the ones that wanted to be there, right? Right. Um, as time went on though, we started getting like my company, the the company that I was teaching for started saying that we're going to be starting to uh, do basically like kind of like large classes. So we'll have you basically teach up to upwards to 100 students Wow, uh, where they would just put you there and on like an iPad or whatever. And, and you would be teaching them and there, there'd be like 100 students watching you and no like actual one on one interaction anymore. You would just be basically te teaching a, a giant uh, gymnasium full of kids. Uh, and it was ridiculous. Like it was one of the, the craziest mm -hmm. things because it's like there, nobody's going to learn that way. But that was like and that was before COVID, like way before COVID. So I, I 
I get what you're saying in terms of like technology and stuff like that, because there's a lot of other, especially Asian countries that have utilized distance learning for a while. So it wasn't, it, it, I don't know if the ramifications of distance learning is going to be as hardcore um, with regards to maybe like the Western style studies, because the like Western, edu Western, Western education systems are a little bit, well, not a little bit, a very different than Asian <laughs> and Eastern style uh, teaching systems. So uh, I don't know. I don't know what the ramifications are going to be in the long run, but I, I don't imagine good. I can tell you here, a lot of the issues that the people had with distance learning was that the parents weren't sending their kids, well, they're barely sending them to school in person, mm -hmm. but they weren't actually making sure they were going to school on their little iPad either. And no one accounted for them and nobody cared. So, I mean, at, at what point do you blame the the parents? Well, yeah, yeah you know? that's exactly it. The parents have to be responsible as well. The other part we that we have to also consider is the fact that teaching is one of the, the few things uh, within our society that's scalable. One person can teach a number of people at the same time. The mm -hmm. problem is we haven't quite really nailed down what's the most effective number. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Ah, that is a well, good point. And, and when we talk about numbers, you also got to consider the fact that you also have different kinds of learners, that you also have yep. kid, kids that don't even know the language. Mm -hmm. And with yeah. inclusion, you also have kids that are mentally disturbed and uh, have special needs as mm -hmm. well. And teachers have to juggle all that and try to figure that out all within the same confines of a classroom. And there well, should I be more flex. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. You go ahead, Jane. Go ahead. I was just going to say there should be more flexibility. Like, I was one of those kids that if you could just tell me what you need done, I would get it done and move on. Like, yeah. I, I didn't need to be in the classroom. I didn't need any of it. Just that's what, like my is, husband. My husband was the do? same way too. Like he's very like he can do it. Like you, you teach him once and you tell him what to yeah. do. He, he's done. Me, I'm the I'm not like that. I'm a very social learner. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, uh, I'm very against. Uh, like I, I was a rebel in school, man. I, <laughs> I didn't listen at all. Like I think that that part of me, um, like knew I was getting conditioned. And mm -hmm. I fought back like big time. Like I was. Do you like, think you would have done better one on one? I think I, I think I may have. Yes, I think I may have. Um, what stuff uh, set off the alarms that you were being conditioned? <sighs> the idea that I was like getting lumped in with uh, so many other kids. The ideas, uh, the ideas that they were teaching us because I came from Iran, so like I already knew what kind of like indoctrination meant in terms of like uh propaganda like when when they teach you propaganda in school like when we had to do like the you know two minutes of hate in iran we had like an hour of like death to america chance right so like i i knew those kind of things like i that those tactics were very familiar to me so when i would experience similar or like just parallel things but in a different way in canada i would be like oh God, like I'm getting conditioned right now. I would just have this like really hardcore backlash to it. Uh, I can't really think of anything like specifically, but just like the idea, for example, like I remember um, I was, I wasn't really that good at math, but that because I wasn't applying myself. But I remember like I went to like one of my teachers and I was trying to get him to explain it to me. And he was like, well, if you don't know it, you just, you just don't know it. You're just dumb. Like, you know, you know, you, mm -hmm. You're gonna have to be held back if, like, because you, you're, you're, uh, like, that you don't understand, uh, this this level that we're teaching now. I think I was in like grade eight, and he's like, if you if you just don't get it, you should have like you should have gotten it by now. If you don't get it, you don't get it, and that's not that's not my problem. And I'm like, it is your problem. You're the teacher. Like, if if I'm if I'm the one that's like I'm the student, you're the teacher, and you have that's that's your your job. responsibility is to make sure that I know this stuff before exactly. I move on. Exactly, yeah. exactly, and and like you know, and, and the fact that I, I would even have to have that conversation with a teacher was just already like mm -hmm. a you know a thing. There was another time where I remember like I was in the yearbook, the the most like the craziest like 
easiest class, right? Yearbook. Like you're like, okay, whatever. It's like a coasting class, right? And I loved yearbook because all you would do is like take pictures and just like, you know, write about people's people's stuff. And I was really good at it. I was good at organizing things. I was good at, I was good at all that kind of stuff. But I had a bad teacher. And one of my, like I remember um, in the class, like all these people were like, (laughs) we were all in groups, because we wanted to be not because we like not that we were forced to be but like all the Chinese kids like hung out with the Chinese kids all the Persian kids hung out with Persian kids all the white kids and like jocks and stuff like that hung out with jocks and like you know popular kids hang out with popular kids and it was just all like that in the groups in the class right Flex, yeah exactly so I had my partners were two Persian girls. We were the only Persian girls in the class. And we were we were just like, you know, chilling out, whatever. Um, and once in a blue moon, I would talk in Farsi to them. Once in a blue moon. Because I, I usually would talk English anyway because I, I really wanted to be accepted as, as Canadian. I didn't want to be Persian. So mm-hmm. I would speak in, in English for most of the time. But when I was with my, you know, two Persian friends, once in a while, I would talk in Persian. So my teacher one time, like I remember he, it was time to like give our kind of like report cards, but it was like midterm report cards or whatever. And we had, I had handed in all my work um, and he gave me an incomplete, like he gave me an I and I like, and I looked at it. I remember I looked at it and I was like, why would you give me an I? I handed it on my work. I went up to him like, and it was like in front of all the class and blah, blah, blah. I was like, why, why did I get an I? And he's like, because you, and, and, and it said, it said on the paper, I still remember it said for speaking Persian in class. And I was like, that has nothing to do with me handing the work. The incomplete would be if I didn't hand in the work, why would me speaking Persian in class have anything to do with the work not being complete? And he was just like, because it's my class and you have to speak English. And I'm like, but all the Chinese kids are speaking Chinese. Like, I don't understand. Like, why is the only, like, the Persian is the only problem. Did any of those people get incomplete? No. Well, then you're a racist. And I got into a huge fight with him in the middle of the class. And guess what? I got suspended for three days. Yeah, that's British Columbia for you. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like, we never had that stuff in Ontario. In fact, um, we didn't have much of a click system in, uh, like, kindergarten to grade eight. But when we got into high school... There was a click system. What was weird is that a lot of us that formed friendships over that period, it was like 30, 35 of us, we all had like hobbies in various other aspects of the school. So we ended up being split up into those clicks, but we would still hang out together in our off hours. Mm -hmm. But by the time we got to the 10th grade, because we kept on interacting and bringing all of our other friends too, the clicks kind of just amalgamated into one giant homogenous group. (laughs) Um, And it was really, it freaked all the teachers out because... They're like, oh, my God, they're gathering against us. They're uniting. Like (laughs) during the lunch hour periods, like the tables used to be kind of separated in little sections, but we'd all kind of like move them together. We had like this giant group of counseling team where we're all talking to each other and like um, bullying went down drastically. Wasn't any violence, like all school spirit stuff where everybody was kind of integrated. And by the 11th grade, we kind of realized, oh, my God, we destroyed the the clique system here. There's nothing like all the years ahead of us, they don't care anymore. They're worried about going to college and university. Mm -hmm. The ones behind us, we're just welcoming them in. We don't care what they're doing. Like the drama kids are hanging out with the football kids and the basketball kids. And there wasn't any like animosity or stuff. And it was really, really great. And the teachers were super, super happy about it because they didn't have to worry about anything. And we got to focus all of our attention on the creepy teachers that were doing weird stuff and like call the cops on them. <laughs> and uh, uh, oh my God. D- doesn't work when one of them, their their father is a uh, city councilor. But we, we tried. Um, oh, my God. But um, no, it was really kind of miraculous. And I remember like the year after we finished high school, um, we were the the graduating class was brought back to do like a basically assembly and a welcoming thing and a big party for the new year and um all of us came back it was like 150 of us and we had a whole lot of fun fun. and then they asked us to come back the next year and when we did we realized that what we had left behind didn't maintain itself the cliques started to form again the cliques came back i I was just gonna say it sounds like such a bizarre like blip in what you're talking about like you should write a book about what you did so that oh no i did a screenplay on it uh the coming of age thing nobody wants it (laughs) we had something very similar happening at our school too but i would 
attribute it more so to the fact that most of us were going to school together in elementary school uh-huh. and junior high. And so by the time we got to high school, that's when everybody did split into other. their different activities, but we were already close. Yeah. So we didn't have those cliques either. Um, yeah, because all, yeah, everybody, all the cliques were friends. Yeah, because you already oh. knew each other. It's different when you don't know each other at all. And I remember, like, yeah. for example, with me in, uh, like, in Canada, like I said, with the Persian kids, like, they had their own clique. And then, like, they'd want me to come hang out with them. And I was like, I don't gotta fucking hang out with you guys because you guys are, like, way <laughs> too Persian. And like, I, I'm Canadian, like, I'm not, I'm not like you. And they started becoming mean because they were all like, oh, this fucking self hating, you know, wanting to be white girl and like, blah, blah. And I'm like, get out of here. Like, you live in Canada. You're the weird ones. Okay. Like, you need to integrate. <laughs> yeah. So I would get well, into fights with the flavor. Persian people. It was, yeah, your it was culture crazy. is the flavor that you add to our multiculturalism. Like, that's Ex- what we like. Exactly. Yeah. Well, exactly. one thing that you also got to keep in mind is that the, the the size of the schools can also play a big, a different role in a lot of these kind of things. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. when you've got a school where you've got like 3,000 kids. And, that's hard, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And remember, we're not really given the resources to help these children integrate. You know, we try, you know, there'll be like an ELL program or something like that. It is very natural Mm -hmm. for kids to gravitate toward people that speak their language that, there's a comfort similar there. experience. And it, yeah. Yes. Because also, I mean, especially kids that are ELL, I mean, God bless them. They don't understand a darn thing any of the teachers are saying. And they're supposed to be doing these really hard subjects. And they don't even understand the language. And so being with them is is a comfort. So clicks are natural and n- not always bad. M- my concern oh. is that I don't like the, the big factory center model of schooling. I don't because, either. Because you throw them all together. Um, what are you going to get? You're going to get fights. You're going to get gangs. You're going to get. And everyone learns at a different pace. See, that's yes. what, that was my problem with, for example, that math teacher is that I was learning at a different pace than the other kids. And there was kids that were even behind me, you know? So like yeah. you, uh, like them sticking us all in the same class and expecting us to perform at the same level was it was asking too much. You're just not, you're not going to get that. And then kids are just going to lash out and they're just going to, you know, feel like they're not being heard, feel uh, completely devastated because they, they, they have no self-confidence in themselves. Then uh, you're just perpetuating that ideology instead of like, uh, you know, understanding that people just learn at a different pace uh, and you have to, you have to work with that. Or they have an aptitude to different subjects better than others or, or worse than others. It, um, but what, we, what we're seeing is um, is more like an oversimplification of the university model. Whereas, because, I mean, you just mentioned that there's a factory aspect into it. And oddly enough, factory the factory structure is mm-hmm. based off the university model because the universities existed first. And then factories right. existed after that, about 700 years after that. So in order to find out efficiency, they're like, they took a model of a system where people were together and how they worked and stuff. And they brought that over to, you know, uh, the first factories of part of the industrial revolution. Mm-hmm. What ends up happening is that there's a dehumanizing element of that, that then kind of was adopted into not so much the universities, but the schools that would lead you to a university so factory workers would be like oh we're going to invest in a training program and they would take what their basic trainings were they they put that as a third party thing so they would hire kit they would not so much hire kids but they would take kids and say you're going to be working in the factory you start here and then you graduate up to the you know the main floor or what have you and and that structure kind of mutated itself and they they kind of went together but the university model had it that you were you were tested to see where you were at and then you would go to the courses that would that suits those those fields. So if you weren't very good at math, but you're very good in English, you'd be in a 401 English class. But mm-hmm. in your math, it'd be a 201 math class. You're still in in school, and you're still learning. It's just that one thing you're learning at your you're just learning at your pace in various different fields, and you're with different kids in each of those classes. Which, oh my gosh, we lost Lena from the monsoon. Uh oh. Oh. But uh, okay. So, well, as I was saying, like, yeah, it's just been perverted and changed and reorganized over the generations because the one thing that uh, people t- tend to sort of advertise when they're running for office or running for uh, positions in, in those types of systems is that we're going to make it simpler and easier for everyone to understand. And 
they're not going to overcomplicate it even though humans are such complex creatures you kind of mm -hmm. have to have a couple of little complicated aspects around them in order to uh, 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 adequately uh, provide the what is needed in order for them to grow so I have it, a, yeah i have a quick question for you guys um earlier we looked at the stats regarding suicide rates among kids and how that's been going up it seems like since around 2007 do you think that the crackdown, the zero tolerance policies um, have contributed to that? It seems like in children's societies, um, they have conflict and the kids resolve it. And it may sometimes result in fighting, but afterward they move on. They either become friends or they learn to leave one another alone, but they're able to sort of deal with it how they need to deal with it in their little worlds. And with these new policies, uh, kids, I think, sometimes feel trapped. Like if they tell the teacher, the teacher can't do anything. They tell the parents, the parents aren't doing anything. The kids themselves can't do anything. And if they do, they face getting kicked out of school. Ah, um, so um, they're left without any defense for addressing bullying and the types of things that social uh, conflict in their little societies that they would normally be able to deal with their own way. Do you think that's contributing to these these issues that kids are having with just living um, in no. today's culture? <laughs> I, I'm sorry. And when I say no, I, I don't. Um, I, zero tolerance. I, I, I agree that that hurts what's going on with um, uh, the, the dynamics in school and the like. But I can tell you here and now that all the suicides, all of that, it all dials back to what's going on in the home and, uh, and the unbelievable rise in mental health. It's not anything that the sc school's doing. I think, I think that in some aspects it doesn't help solve bullying and bullying is a very big deal, but it's these, these children are in despair Mm -hmm. that i i've never seen anything like it uh, but it's definitely grown exponentially and i think it climaxed with the pandemic that we have a mental health crisis um what do you think has been contributing to it the mental health crisis mm -hmm. oh well uh, in, in many cases um you uh, stress is put on students. Uh, I, they're in an unnatural environment, but I'm saying like, and also their home environments. Mm -hmm. um, is it because you think there's a greater conflict in relationships and things like that? Yes. And, and, you know, you have situations where it's just not uncommon that there's a revolving door of either a different mom, a different dad every week. You know, you got kids that are living homeless. You got kids that are, trafficked you've got kids that are beaten um and it, it just seems like as our society has become more coarse the the children are the ones that are being suffer suffering on this and and then you add drugs to it and you add sex to it um so sometimes these things will happen when you know, someone was sexually active at a very young age. And when they broke up, they just totally overreact like where it used to be. If you broke up, it's like, oh, OK, whatever. But their their hearts are broken. Mm -hmm. But Would it just seems like there's, there's been issues for I mean, we've we've had child abuse historically. We've had the breakdown of the family going on for some time now. No, we not that not like what we've seen. What Not like what we see now. The thing, it, the thing to me is that what's also contributing to all of this is let's say we're not talking about a very, um, you know, extreme degree of either like physical or sexual abuse in the home or whatever. We're not talking about that, but we are talking about, uh, kids, um, are very, uh, they, 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 want uh, steady paced uh, life like they want they want their they want structure they want structure they want uh, safety safety and they they want re repetition like you well, have that's, 
Yeah. You have to do that because if you don't, and and once that breaks, right? Like let's say parent loses a job, or now you have to go home and and not learn in school, or like you're not getting up every morning anymore to go to this, and your your whole routine. That's the word I was looking for. Routines are very very important for kids, and if they if if you break the routines, it's automatically like they're they're going to start suffering. No matter how no no matter how that is right like uh, yeah in fact um, you make actually a very great point and, and this can actually go back to before pre pandemic um, children were getting very confused between the structure of what goes on with their home versus the structure that goes on in the school because there is a parallel there and that is the adult is technically the person we're learning from or the authority at home if you do something bad you get punished at school you do not there's a lot of confusion for a child like that. Mm -hmm. especially when the administration has said okay so we have a teacher who sees a conflict and needs to resolve it but they cannot physically do anything to do that in mm -hmm. which case the kid is like well why can i get away with stuff here but i can't get away with stuff at home okay i'm gonna go and get away with as much as i want at school drive the teacher nuts cause a whole bunch of issues with the, the kids and then when i go home even if the teacher tells my parents parents aren't really gonna probably gonna do anything because it could the parents could see it as either conjecture or the fact that the parents are like, well, I've taught my kid this lesson. He knows not to do that. So clearly something's up or, or she's something up. Like it, it's just very, very confusing. And what I think we're seeing as a result is that because there's this, this great distance with regards to the, uh, the locations of where these children are going from home to school, that, yeah, they're, they're, they're losing that structure. They're losing the consistency of it. They don't, they don't realize that the rest of the world is going to hit them way harder than a parent or a teacher would at this point. So they, all they know at this point is that, oh, if I piss off my parents, I'm gonna face a consequence. But in the real world with the school, because as far as they consider, so, socially speaking, the school is the real outside world, which it is most certainly not. In school, they can get away with that stuff. And then what do we have? Over the last two years, we've seen people out in public doing terrible things, mm -hmm. property damage and whatnot, mm -hmm. and not facing any consequences. So now we're reaffirming the very thing that as parents we we were it's, we experienced growing up getting disciplined and in school these kids should have also been getting adequately disciplined i'm not saying you have to hit them or anything but just no. you know maybe you have to get physical in there with regards to separation physically separate mm -hmm. and then have actual tangible consequences that can can affect the kid and hopefully make them understand the difference between the actions and, and the consequences of those actions and and you, you're like, I mean, you're just hitting the nail on the head here for me too, because before I was about to, uh, be, like, before I got rudely interrupted by my own internet <laughs> uh, and I got kicked out, um, I w was listening to you, Teresa, talk about, you know, me the, the idea of mental illness in the classroom and uh, men mental illness is, is, is a big one uh, because now a lot of these kids that you know, I've grown up and they're like, we're going to become teachers now, have mental illness, okay? There's a lot of mentally ill people teaching kids right now. Uh, and we're going to get into that in, in just a second. Let me just read these super chats. We got John Parson here. Thank you so much for the $20. Very generous of you. I went to school before all of this CRT woke business. Also, both of my parents were teachers and I was learning from them. I do have, uh, I do have family members that have been and continue to homeschool. Uh, that's great. And uh, having having uh, teachers as parents is a bonus, man. Uh, mm -hmm. Like that, that's a that that's awesome that you were able to te you know uh, get 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 that on on in both uh, ways. And I feel like CRT and woke business has always kind of been in schools in a little like now it's just it's it's very very in your face. Um, I don't know. It, it's I, I kind of thought it was. It, it to me, it seems like it's just going from one extreme to the other. Yeah. Because you had when I was in school, one of the big issues was how the founding fathers and the pilgrims and everybody could do no wrong. They were idealized. They were romanticized. History uh, as a whole was romanticized. And now it's, you know, everybody who isn't basically everybody who's a straight white male is evil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> instead yeah. of just yeah. saying that they were complex <laughs> right. well and also like the idea to me now that you not just critical race theory the um god which 
what's the word? Uh, what's the word for that one where uh, th they're making systems so that if you're uh, like, for example, like Chinese people aren't being accepted. Oh, the in credit the score. The social credit, credit score. score? Oh, the social, the social, the social score, credit score, score, and the thing. Yeah, basically, like if you're if you're Asian, uh, you know, like if if you're black, like you know, you're you don't have to score well as 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 well as like the Asian students or whatever. Like they're dumbing the curriculums down so that, uh, you know, the people of color can can go to school more or whatever. And I feel like that's in itself kind of racist. Like it's like what about the people who actually apply themselves and learn and do these tests and they can, and, and they can go like, I don't, I, you know, it, it, it's all getting very convoluted and, and seems to not do exactly what they want it to do. Like it's doing and, the opposite. And no, if we're, pity. and if we're, if we're confused, Nina, can you imagine being a kid or <laughs> a teenager who don't do not have the capacity to comprehend these things. I, mm -hmm. I, I mean, we don't have the capacity to, to comprehend them and, and they're forcing it on children that are ill equipped mm -hmm. to, to deal in, in these pressure cookers <laughs> of schools, just as we've been describing. Um, but that's it's, why it's so important for kids to have a good support system. And yes. that's why it's so important for families to be involved and, and alert as to what's happening in their school, in their community, in their country, and keeping their kids on the right track for in terms of doing what's best for them and, and their what's values. best for their family and their values. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Uh, 200 Watt Studios, thank you so much for the $5, man. If you're willing to teach your kids, or sorry, if you're not willing to teach your kids, uh, your students that are having an issue learning, then you are not a teacher. You are an overpaid babysitter. You're freaking absolutely right. Oh, yeah. yeah you want to know the biggest uh, tell of how if a teacher's good or not? If they went from high school to teacher's college to teaching high school, they're a bad teacher. Oh, shit. <laughs> they are objectively so they're missing all the fundamental qualities of social of social interaction and understanding the value of the education they have because they haven't actually put it into practice to see the, the real world results of what they've learned exactly um, it, it's just the case i know one person who I, I grew up with who did that exact same thing was a poor teacher and what she ended up doing is she just got pregnant so that she could go on maternity leave and not have to teach and get paid she oh, managed God. to get away with that three times before the school said, you have not taught here enough to still warrant your pay. So we are going to fire you. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell, man? That's just the, like, that's just the user. Wait, who gets know. pregnant to get out of work? That's, <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's more work. Wow. That's, that's weird. Wasn't for her. <laughs> she thought it was easy. <laughs> My God. Uh, the John Beck, thank you so much for the $5 says, so script is admitting he and his friends were hippies. Uh, well, we're, we're productive hippies. <laughs> if that's, I mean, it's an oxymoron, but it, I mean, it was. That like, is true. That's we, such we an oxymoron. It was so weird because we just did not care about the, the clicks itself, but we really love the free exchange of knowledge and hobbies and, and everything of that nature. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a blast. I mean, every once in a while, I'll get an email from a teacher that after they've just retired or something saying like the, the three year, like because I went to school, I was part of like the, the OAC curriculum because that was kind of running itself out at the time in Ontario. Okay. So it's a, it's five, it's four years of high school and then an additional year for um, ac uh, advanced academic credit, credit. So you can go to university straight out of high school as opposed to doing like a year at, at college and then going into high school. So uh, cheaper. Um, but yeah, that- <laughs> I'm by, sorry, but I just read this and I died. Uh, Shane, <laughs> you says, I tried the whole getting pregnant thing, but they didn't believe me for some oh reason. My oh my goodness. Oh my God, awesome. Shane. Well, you should have uh, canceled them, Shane. How dare they? I know. I know. Men can get pregnant too. <laughs> Damn it. Uh, 200 Watt Studios, thank you so much for the $2. Says, it's not just the smile. It's the smile and the eyes. Oh, thank you. I don't know if you can see that. That's probably really bad. I don't know. I don't know what doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I just got another super chat here from Michael Gonzalez. Thank you so much for the $10. Says, I was uh, a 90s Chicago school bean counter. Uh, we had a bilingual transition education, but the teachers held kids back to keep jobs. This was bad as kids needing assistance could not, by definition, be in honors. Yeah. You oh, also had a thing with kids yeah. being held back to play sports. Yep. Down here in the South. <laughs> Not <laughs> only that, um, you have to also be very wary of the third party 
um, uh, tutoring programs, especially the system ones, because the the testing that they use is designed specifically to make the make it appear that the student is not to the uh, same level as their peers, so that the parents will pay for this tutoring program to help them do better in school. Um, and uh, I, I learned this with my uh, third oldest god daughter. Um, her, her English teacher was absolutely terrible. And so her, her teacher said that she had a problem with comprehension. And uh, so I got tasked because I'm the screenwriter <laughs> to, help her out with, to help her out with English. And her parents also signed her up for uh, a private tutoring school, like an after school private, private tutoring th session. It was like you go to like five or six teachers for two hours and try to get your whatever skill you're filling up. And so they, I, I knew that she was a smart girl and that she could read and write very well and better for her age. But um, her parents took her to this school, uh, this tutoring thing. She did a test. And they said, oh, yeah, she's uh, grade 10, but she's got an English comprehension level of a grade 8. And I'm just like, that's not right. Mm, yeah. So I went to the school and I said, can I just take the test? And uh, I did. And I, I figured out that um, – if you if you answer certain questions in a certain pattern, they throw in a very very advanced uh, question afterwards to knock your score down and cycle it through. And thankfully, because I remember how to um, access source code from my years in high school, I was able to print out the source code and then I took it to my old computer programming teacher, and he basically confirmed that yeah, there's an algorithm in here to make sure every student does not uh, do as well as they uh, can, so that That's they can insane. game into it. So then we. I convinced uh, my my friends, um, and they pulled her out. And then I just I just tutored her and helped her try to understand what the the, the English teacher was terrible. She could not explain what she That's wanted insane. from her students I'm at all. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, I hate tests and like the whole. Yeah, um, well, I was trying to quantify a uh, basically a, an intangible skill, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's the thing too is, I mean, good tests or good good evaluations are actually very difficult to come up with. Mm -hmm. um, and to talk on a little bit on a bigger level, when we're talking about bad teachers and stuff. Uh, also keep in mind that it takes a long time to develop the skills that it is need to be a teacher and that you only have like one semester of student teaching and that is not enough that they, mm. need, uh, they need to go no, to more of I, an apprentice model. So like you may, you, it's very possible that you might have a bad teacher, but in five years, that teacher might be superb because they always want to hire people right out of college because they're cheaper. Okay. Cause you're right. paid for years of experience. Uh, my experience has actually been that <laughs> it kind of like the opposite, like, um, you have like you have some really good teachers just fresh out of the you know fresh out of teaching school or whatever and they're like yes like i'm gonna go and shape the, the youth and so hopeful and then they go and start working and then they realize how fucked up the system is and then they become like heavy drinkers and they become <laughs> jaded well yeah i mean that's true too. jaded and and, and yeah. they like basically they give up on on the students because they realize the system is fucked up. Like, you know, it's kind of like designed to like what script doctor was saying, kind of set you up to fail in some ways. Especially um, well, on the private side of things for at least that story. But on, on the public side, what I've noticed is that the best teachers I had didn't start teaching until they're in their early forties, which means that they had been doing other careers prior before mm -hmm. they went into teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and what's also funny is that those teachers were always the best evaluated. The parents always loved them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, again, my, my computer programming and problem solving teacher was a professional computer programmer for 20 years before he got fed up with that system and said, I'll just go to teaching because I get summers off. <laughs> and little yeah. did he realize he'd well, have to finish no. summer you school. <laughs> well, but yes. it used to be pretty common. That used to be pretty common when people yeah. would sort of decide to leave their professions and go into schools. I think that's something we should promote more, actually. Yeah. It well, really think is. About it. You, he you, said you, it was better for him to at least attempt to try and reduce the level of idiots by 30 students a year than to try and do that in a work environment. <laughs> so if you get them young, it's easier. <laughs> wow. Yeah, well, it's going to say, and that makes logical sense because also you have maturity also involved as well. Uh, when and I you would, probably experienced failure. Well, that, that too... And you understand and, how to recoup from that and, and move on and persevere. You can teach well, those I can skills. tell you this. In the private schools here, that like where my husband teaches, they have kind of like that 
they kind of take after the whole no child left behind policy. I, I can tell you this, the entire school system here, especially the private school system here is based on the, uh, on the basically participation trophies. You, you, they don't, they do not fail students. Um, they, it, it is the most insane, like kind of stuff that I, I like I've ever actually experience within any school system because I mean I'm used to the Canadian school system so when I started teaching or like when my husband was teaching and was telling me some of the stories here I was like oh my god like I, I cannot believe like how, how that that these kids are being educated in this way because how can you even educate anybody in this way because they literally have no standards in terms of like right or wrong they have no standards in terms of like okay so uh, I did. I failed this test because I didn't complete the work on time, or I didn't do enough, or whatever. Like it's just like you you have to give them a passable grade, no matter what. It's crazy. Yeah. Let me tell you something a little bit even crazier. Um, one of the issues we've seen, and I don't, don't want to say it's you know t perfectly normal, but you do see this phenomenon here, where parents, particularly low income parents, who know they can apply for some sort of social security benefit for their children if their children have a disability mm -hmm. will manufacture it or contribute to it in some way. So for example, they will go out of their way not to get their children help if they need mental health assistance, or they'll go out of their way not to educate their children at home or encourage them to get an education, or they'll encourage bad behavior so that they can be diagnosed with something to get them a check for their child. That's that fucked evil. up. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Remember what I was saying, what Nina was saying earlier um, and about teachers getting jaded and turning alcoholic and all of that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Jane. <laughs> I'm, just saying, I'm just saying, you're just explaining it right here, right there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It, it, it'll, it'll bring you to the pits of despair if you actually think too hard about some That's of the why things that happen. Sometimes I actually like want to say to teachers, like, thank you for your service, because it literally is like going to war. And uh, like every day, the, the, the kind of shit that you see and the, the kind of shit you have to deal with and some of these really broken kids that you had like, and it just freaking breaks you, man. Like it just it because mm -hmm. you know what's happening and then they come to you um, as, yeah. as, as a like, you know, and as a, a kind of like a second parents because their home is just like not safe or whatever. And it's just, I mean, it's some of the most hardcore experience uh, stories I've ever heard has been from second parents, nurse, They're second parents. Yeah. We we are expert. First <laughs> parent sometime. Yeah. Everything. Well, everything. I mean, when you have to, re we have to, we're cops, we have to report. I had, I had a friend that was a teacher in the middle of the night. He was called because a kid was, a, you know, about ready to jump off some, building or something and they said he said the only person he would talk to was his teacher and so he had to go and talk him off of the building mm -hmm. uh, also remember teachers get beat up a lot uh you know i used to get hit you know uh, yeah, yeah they get it, physically abused yeah get physically abused yeah and uh, uh usually not much happens uh there's i mean even especially in the states because you guys like you get you even get like you know school shootings over there. Like well, I was, I was about to say, you don't shit. know, and you don't know when someone's starting to lose their crap, they're going to come in and blow you all away. Yeah, uh, you don't day. know. Like I mean, that that's been kind of like a. The it's been an shooting, ongoing issue. Yeah, it's been an ongoing issue, but the and school no law that's been passed is, over the last thirty years has mitigated because that's that's not really how it works. Yeah. Well, and also the school shooting thing is to me has been a little bit like only kind of like a United States thing. It's like it's not a it's not like it doesn't really happen in Canada. Like we've had stabbings and stuff like that, like before, but mm -hmm. very rarely. Um, and I don't know, like I, I I don't really hear that kind of those kind of stories from uh, Europe. Like, do you guys have you guys ever heard of school shootings, like mass shootings from anywhere else in the world other than the United States? I remember some in Australia back in the day, but those were still few and far between. Well, yeah. there, one thing that does make school shootings prevalent here in the United States is access. Uh, mm. but in, most of the time, these children are using guns that belong to their parents, right? Uh, or 
Gun safety is important, people. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're supposed to keep them locked up. Or also, if you're in the case of the, the Parkland shooter, he, he was able to go get him by himself. And because of the Promise program, that's another phenomenon, that if you commit a crime in school, it doesn't get reported. And he would not have been able to have gotten those guns if he, if the his criminal record was able to be re reported. Logged and if with he was the authorities. Be arrested. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So that's another phenomenon. I we don't have that here. Yeah. Actually, one of the big things we we do uh, do here in Canada is that you you screw up on school property, everybody knows about it. Even Everyone knows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like yeah. They that's put the up a to posting to all the parents. <laughs> Yeah, when well, that's they something say to it's keep gonna in go mind. on your permanent record, they fucking mean that in Canada. Like you will yeah. not get away with it if you like do anything, even in kindergarten, it's on your permanent. But record. the problem with with trying to do that here is that we already have a ridiculous justice system that prosecutes children for dumb things that you would never have gotten prosecuted for before. So wow. it's like everybody would have a record. Yeah, like when I was a because kid, well, it's financially prosperous for the. The, the prisons and, yeah, well, and there's the got to be. Given all calls and, yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, but yeah, and I understand what you're saying, Jane, but there's got to be a happy medium between that and when someone is very clearly a psychopath. Like, it, yes. If, if you want to read a, a book that'll scare the sh out of you, uh, it's called Why Meadow Died by Andrew Pollock. His daughter was killed. And he goes into everything that led up to this shooting and how this guy was clearly a psychopath uh, or, or whatever is wrong with him. And at every level he was passed along, they passed the buck. Mm -hmm. They let him be in with these students. And, and then of course, what you know, was none this, of this book called again? Teresa? Ted, Why Meadow died. If, if you want to, every teacher, every, if you want to know about education in America, it's called Why Meadow died. Andrew Pollock. But the thing is, you don't have good mental health services here either. It's not like you can put your, let's say you have a family member who has serious mental health issues and they're a danger mm -hmm. to themselves or others. What do you do? Who do oh, you no. call? Where do you well, put them? Well, and that's been a problem with this too, is that, yeah, here it is, is that it was the same thing with him. I mean, sometimes his own mother would call the cops on him. But and, the cops can't do anything. Oh, I know. I'm aware. But what I'm saying is, yeah, is that they can't get the mental health. But on the other hand, what do they do? They send them to school with your children. <laughs> that's what I'm, it, but that's my point yeah. is yeah. That the problem in this country, in addition to everything else, is that we don't have a good system, a healthcare system that properly addresses mental health. The only thing people can, the only thing people know to do is to call the police. And that's just going to get somebody killed. Well, well, that's that's oh, yeah. I mean, we have a mental yeah. health crisis. Absolutely, it's a mental health crisis. That's kind of what I was thinking, like with the suicide too. We don't have facilities. We don't have, you know, any type of structure. There's just nothing anyone can do, and it costs. Even if you try to go through the courts to try to get some sort of authority over someone, some sort of curatorship, it costs an incredible amount of money to go through that process. So, it families have have no help. They have nowhere yeah, to Yeah, I mean, we, yeah. They, 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 there definitely needs to be more of a, like a, a therapist or like some, somebody in schools that people can talk to. I mean, uh, and not a guy, guidance counselor. That's not what they're not supposed a guidance to do. <laughs> no, yeah, exactly. No, no. Well, and what do they have? I mean, if they do have one, they'll have like three for like, a school of 4,000 kids. That's uh, true, too. Yeah, but no, I, I know exactly what you're talking about, Jane. I mean, I don't know what the answer is, but it, it, it's... I think the answer terrible. is just to, to make freaking schooling smaller, just like everything else. We need to decentralize education in a way that... Uh, so kids are getting more attention uh, because there's like, you know, less students when there's l like less students, there's more attention of one on one and whatever. And then like everything else will also, you know, lessen like the pressure and everything else. It's just I, I think that th this is the centralized system is not working. It's just well, not it's, working. it's not even really decentralized. It's more consolidated because, again, they're packing more and more into mm -hmm. a, yes. a school with less. And the other part, too, is, again, we're, we don't want to end up in the same situation that we were with the baby boomers where we're just hiring people just to be in the room to there. watch these kids. Yeah. 
So you have to actually uh, understand uh, something that's kind of going to be the most difficult lesson for even parents to accept is that sometimes the kids just have to be failed and held back. And it doesn't matter how much you. shouting and screaming they do. It has there to be There has done. to be consequences. Like if you're, if you're not going to like, it, like, I just, I'm so sick and Cause there's nothing to no say that even if they're held back, that they can't go to summer school for two years and then join the rest of their friends in the, in the appropriate year that they would have been, had they not failed. Like there are always avenues and outlets to explore, but it comes mm -hmm. down to understanding a concept of responsibility, understanding mm -hmm. a concept of um, proper uh, financial investment and not abuse of, right. the, of the mm. things. And then also, you know, uh, the parents being civically minded to get involved in those things, whether it be for public school or private school, charter school, or, or anything, uh, uh, any other alternative that comes into play that can, that can achieve the, the job that we need, which is that we need our children to be understanding of the, the function of the world and the value of why we have the lessons that we, that we teach. Yeah, absolutely. And they also, also get very... some mental health facilities too. We need places. Yeah, those need to come back. Put... They've been gone for what, 30 years now? Yeah. I agree yeah. with you. There's uh, a way to do them and make them more humane. I mean, because that was part of the problem before is that they were these. You know, I'm a big places. fan of a water hose. You you, you <laughs> know, it's a kid with a water hose. <laughs> And, so hose them down. Them. and if they don't respond to that, you still got a hose you can whip them with that that doesn't leave too bad of a mark. There you go. Bring back the paddle. I'm just joking. <laughs> that, uh, the paddle. You might break watts, your paddle, though. <laughs> 200 Watt Studios, thank you so much for the $5. The lighting is perfect. It could be the aura glow of her charisma. You are just a smooth talker, man. Uh, and then we had Diego Flores, thank you for the five, says, in Peru, by law, you have to fail the student if they can't get the grade or face penalties. And no private school wanted that hmm. mark. Ooh, that's interesting. Oh, I like that model. <laughs> that's interesting. See, there yeah. you go. See, other countries have very different models of education. Uh, John Burns, thank you so much for the $5. It's good to see you, man. Uh, says the biggest mass shooting and stabbing and arson during 2020 happened in Nova Scotia. I heard about the stabbing. I don't. I didn't hear about I remember, the shooting. I remember the shooting, but I, what was that, seven people? Was, yeah, it was seven people, and the RCMP had to come in and take them out. Wow, I didn't hear. I don't. I didn't hear about the shooting, but I did hear about the stabbing. And I know the the stabbing one. I I didn't. I actually didn't hear about the one in Sco Nova Scotia. I heard about in freaking uh, Abbotsford, British Columbia. It was a huge, oh, I remember was, that one too. Yeah, there yeah. was a stabbing, was and stabbing. It, was, it was crazy because I remember that because that was really close to home for me. So I was like, oh damn, uh, yeah. that was crazy. Dude just walked in and started stabbing people. Um. Uh, John Burns for another 10. Thank you so much. Says, remember uh, Slender Man? To yes, yes, that was a crazy thing. Was that Two in Wisconsin? Old... Uh, I don't know. I don't remember. Was. Two 12-year-old girls ended up stabbing another schoolgirl in rural forest because they the they obsessed Slender Man like Abraham uh, taking his son up the mountain and, and to, to kill his uh, son, Isaac. There's a, I think it's either a documentary or a movie they made about the Slender Man too. I think it's on HBO. There's two of them, yeah. There's the documentary and the and the actual horror film. Oh, okay. So there's okay, there's both. I I I saw a little bit of the documentary and it was so freaky that I was like, I can't watch this anymore. Like this is making me go mental. Uh, mm. Hey, Valiant Renegade, good to see you, man. Hey. Uh, eight more likes Hello. to a hundred. Wow, Yay. smash that like, everybody. Thank you. Uh, and two hundred watts. Do you say I may be a smooth talker, but your voice is smooth, jazz talker. Oh my god, two hundred watts studios. You're funny. You're funny. Hey, Sam. Yeah. Good to see you, mm -hmm. man. Hang in there over there in Australia. I know people are going crazy. Uh, John Burns says, I think it was Wisconsin. That's crazy. Um, yet, uh, Rory, I know Japanese schools have a very interesting model where there are uh, no janitors and the kids are responsible for keeping the school clean. Uh, yes. Yes, I have. Yes, I have seen it in anime. And their school system is 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 crazy. Uh, the school system in Japanese, I wouldn't uh, in Japan. I wouldn't say is a great one though, because the, the suicide rates in Japan are extremely high. Probably the highest. Uh, I think. Uh, I I don't know if it's, it's the highest because now. Of stress? Yeah, because it's stress, stress and overwork. Stress and dishonoring overwork. families. That's a, yeah. one aspect family. of the of the culture. Yeah. Yeah, it's really it's really big. Like if you like fail, basically, your your kids kill themselves like immediately because they're, they're yeah, like, oh there's my God, shame. yeah there's shame there's a lot of shame that goes along with that now okay so we're almost done with the show here but i really wanted to touch on one more thing 
which was this video that dropped a couple of days ago. Um, I saw this and oh, I've seen Lord. a lot of stuff like this. Okay. So um, this is just like the newest one. First um, of all, just before we start, I wouldn't trust my two-year-old with anyone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, even normal people. Like, I mean, I would have to like, vet people for a long time before I'm like, yeah, here's my two-year-old. Yeah, like, even as a two-year-old, like, what you do is you, you take your two-year-old to, like, a park, and then you play with the two-year-old, and the two-year-old plays with the kids, and you talk to the parents, and you always keep your eye on your two-year-old. And the moment that they get a line, you just snatch them up, and you take them back home and, you know, mm -hmm. and try again the next day because exactly. it's really important for them to – to meet other people at that age. <laughs> yes. Uh, Teresa, and not honey, people do you, like this. <laughs> do you need to go? Yeah, I, I got to bail. I, I got to I got to go. So, um it's been it's been a good time. It's been <laughs> very depressing. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's been, no. it's been a fascinating conversation no, though. It's been, no, but no, when I say let me rephrase that. It's been good because I think these are things that we need to talk about because these are things that people are not talking about. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I guess if I were to say one thing to end all this party is if you are a parent, if you've got a kid in school, you find out what's really going on. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's uh, all I got to say about that. And uh, as always script. Great. Thank you, Jane. And, uh, yeah, I, I've got to go. Of so, course. Uh, have you a wonderful can find night, Teresa. Teresa's uh, night. YouTube channel and Twitter in the description. Thank you, Teresa, for joining us this evening. Okay. Uh, and I will see you Sunday. Yes. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Uh, Bye. Okay. So we're going to just watch this and just talk a little bit about how crazy these kind of stuff is as well uh, that's happening in our world. Uh, but before we press play, a couple of super chats just dropped. Uh, Echo Base Network, thank you so much for the five. Says, hail guys, love uh, loving the stream. And you got a great panel on tonight. Miss mm -hmm. you guys in Vegas for the big meetup. Uh, I was having an insane amounts of FOMO uh, not being there. Uh, and An insane amount. I can't even explain it to you. Uh, so <laughs> the next Florida one, I will definitely be there for sure. I'll definitely be at the Florida one. Yes, Jane, Woo! you and I are going to meet. We're going to go and drink. We're going to, oh my God, it's going to be good. It's gonna be You're going to cause times. a lot of trouble, the two of you, aren't you? Oh, yes. God. <laughs> uh, we are, I already looked it up. Jane and I are like best friends, like in terms of like our uh, Zodiac signs. Apparently, we would make like best friends. So yeah. it's going to happen. That's some happen. sir fire science right there. <laughs> yeah. It's 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 written in the stars. Uh Valiant Renegade, thank you so much for the five dollars. Says I wasn't in Vegas, but yeah, what Nick said. Great job, folks. Aw, <laughs> you're so sweet. I can't like I, I hope I get to meet you too in the in the Florida one. Okay, so this crazy person right here, um, she had some things to say. Here we go. Story time. This has been my first year in preschool with a class of my own, teaching alongside another queer she doesn't brush her teeth. educator, and we have been Ew. rocking our two's class. We've been talking about gender and skin color and consent and empathy and our bodies and autonomy. It's been fabulous. You're talking about consent with two-year-olds? our teaching team is shifting, and a new person is being onboarded, someone with many years of experience. So today at the lunch table, when the topic of gender and genitals came up, one of our students no, it didn't. plainly looked up and said, mm -mm. well, I'm a girl today, but I know that teacher Ko isn't. No, they're Envy. And the look on the incoming teacher's face was priceless. She was shocked in a good way. And she just looked around at the two of us and said, this class is incredible. And I am so impressed. No, she didn't. <laughs> Two-year-olds don't talk that advanced. Um, um, on top so of that, she brought up the genital stuff. <laughs> yeah, How there's are they so talking much about genitals with preschoolers. Nobody's talking about genitals with with preschoolers. Meaning, I mean, I can see. Okay, let me rephrase this because preschoolers do talk about genitals. Actually, they all, that's all they talk about. Especially boys, um, all they talk about is. PP, penis. Well, we've just learned how to well, aim. The We're toilet trained and now we can aim. It's really it. cool. <laughs> I mean, I get that script, but they do, especially boys talk about penises all the time. That's all they talk about. Penis, poop, whatever, like all, all that kind of stuff. Anything that comes out of your body. That's 
little boys. Uh, not so much girls. I don't think girls talk about genitals all that much. It's not until way later, like when they're like, okay, like yeah, what's no, the story? No, we, we're big on like mucus and boogers and stuff that has that too. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So like, but like we were taught about um the basics of of like you know if you don't want to be touched, just say you don't want to be touched, but never with regards to the details and what that means and all that stuff. Like that's. That's exactly. what, that was way too complicated for for a, for a preschooler. Just like if you don't feel like you want to be touched, just let them know you don't want to be touched, and it's, there's not a problem. And like, oh, why did your child say something like, "I'm a girl today"? Exactly, and like what, like the idea of stranger danger. Okay, like you, yep. we we would talk about the story, like you know, if you if if somebody is coming up to you and they're a stranger and they offer you candy, you say no. If they offer you anything, you say no. If they ask you if, if they can touch you, you say no. You you know you teach them about their bubble, you teach them about their whatever. And again, most of this stuff does not. Do, like it shouldn't even be done in school it should be done in the home the parents is the person has to teach their kids mm -hmm. about how a stranger shouldn't touch you and how a stranger shouldn't do anything to you or you shouldn't take candy from strangers these are things that parents have to be teaching their kids not a freaking preschool teacher i i, I believe in that like i don't i think you if you're teaching preschool the only thing i need you to teach are colors shapes numbers shapes Things like weather. that. Remember the yeah. weather part of school? That was the coolest part. <laughs> that was yeah, I love weather. The weather is great. Uh, I like shapes. Uh, I like throwing rings and, you know. <laughs> Nina, did you ever get in elementary school um, the play about Robin and uh, and the and Stranger Danger? No. So Robin is I was, basically. Because I, I, I came to Canada when I was 10. So I was in grade five when I came. I didn't go. So that would be about the time you get it. Yeah. Oh, uh, I don't but, but basically, Robin was a, a character. You didn't know if they were a boy or a girl because, again, it was just to represent everybody. Okay. And they would the setting would be at like a little park. And then um, there'd be three other actors that were clearly dressed as adults. Mm -hmm. And they would set up situations that you might be in as a kid. And, and the Robin kid would be learning, oh, I, this is a bad situation. I should tell, it, tell an adult I trust. Or this is a good situation. This is OK. And so, and so forth and so forth. And and now it's gotten to the point where it's like you don't actually have that type of entertainment value and nuance and open discussion. It's just like we're just mm -hmm. going to go way too young and we're just going to say that every kid could be this Robin kid where they don't have an identity <laughs> or anything of that nature as opposed to something that you as an, as an individual watching could supplant yourself into that position. It's very, mm -hmm. very, very – I mean it was a good play for what it is. It taught you the basics. It didn't scare anybody. And it definitely didn't cross any lines because parents were watching the show too. And if, if parents got upset about it, they'd, they would let you know. <laughs> that's um, not, that, sounds, uh, that sounds familiar, but I don't remember. You know what I do remember is that weird um, commercial with the puppets. Do you remember that? I'm trying to look it up. Oh, right yeah. Now. Like the don't you put it in your mouth puppet? Yes, the what? don't you put it in your mouth one. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, this is, on the, this is a PB. I think it was a PBS commercial or a Canadian PBS commercial that they put on television and they had these here jingles. It here it <laughs> is. Yeah. I actually, I'm pulling it up right now. Oh, my God. oh God. It was, a, it was a catchy song. It, it played all the time. Oh, my God. I remember this because I I used to listen to this all the time. And then I remember I used to sing it. And my mom was like, my mom came home and was like, what the hell are you singing? Um, It was messed up. <laughs> that looks scary. It's a little. We are always telling you, don't put that in your mouth. Let's find out. Hi, Hi kids. Why are we on television anyway? We're here to tell a little story about why you shouldn't put things into your mouth when you don't know what they are and why you should never take anything a stranger tries to give you. Why not? Because if you ate somebody else's medicine, some bad food, or some poison, you could get very sick. Ugh, I don't want to be sick. And that's why before you eat anything, you should always ask someone you love if it's okay. Okay, I love you. Can I eat the guitar? No, oh. but, but you can help me sing a song about eating things that don't belong inside you. Okay, I wasn't really hungry anyway. Well, wait, maybe a little bit. Okay, everybody, if you see something that you want to eat before you do anything, remember this song. Don't you put it in your mouth. Don't you put it in your mouth. Don't you stuff it in your face. Don't. <laughs> so it might look good to eat. So it might look good to eat. And it might look good to take. <laughs> Shane might... said this just took a dark turn. <laughs> Sick, yuck. real quick, yuck. real 
sick, real thick. Don't you put it in your mouth, uh-uh. Tell you what you love, that's right, sis. If it's okay to eat, if it's okay to eat, like a muffin or a bee. Like a muffin or a bee. If you don't know, just watch it eat. Don't you put it in your mouth, Remember, boys and girls, don't you put it in your mouth. It worked. <laughs> you know, until you got to the age of foreplay, in which case that just it just made a whole mess of things. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's oh. one way to end the show. Wow. That is a great uh, way to end the show, actually. <laughs> Oh my God. Uh, Stephen Ann, thank you so much for the $5. It says, Hail, Dina, Script, Jane, Teresa, and Chat. Good to know that school teachers are even more insane than when I was in school. Yeah, th things get crazier yeah. as time goes, uh, time goes on. But the, uh, like the idea to me, though, that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of teachers doing this kind of stuff, like teaching these ideologies and stuff like that is alongside the idea that my kids get, would be social distance in school and and just be wearing these masks for eight hours at a time and, and you know, different things like that. It all makes me want to homeschool my kid or like figure out an alternative where uh, they're getting taught values that I that I hold dear. There was another video that that was going around a couple of uh, months ago. And that one was really interesting too because I remember Lauren Chen shared that one. And it was about, it was during Pride Month and this lesbian teacher was giving out cup, cupcakes to like all the students and she didn't want to give one to like a straight white kid or something like that. And then the kid was like making a big deal out of it. And so she was like, well, you're a straight white kid so you don't get one or something. Like something to those lines. Do you guys remember that video? I don't. Not it was, too much, no. It's not it was ringing a bell. It was something along those lines that happened, okay? But it was some something like an LGBTQ teacher was talking down to a to a kid that was a uh, straight white uh, male. Um, now because they're so confident in that at that age, right? <laughs> right, and um, and it it just was really weird. It was a really weird video, and when when it was going around, it was it went viral. Um, and one of the biggest discussions was let's put cameras in the classroom. And I was like, I don't know if I'm down with this idea of putting cameras in the class classroom because like, and, and, and the argument on both sides was like, okay, well, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, public places already have cameras and, uh, you know, police have cameras, they have body cams now and like all this stuff. So teachers should have cameras in the classrooms. And I just don't think that, more big brother and more more of the same thing uh is is going to be the solution to these problems like uh i i don't know how do you guys feel about this whole like let's put more cameras in classrooms and keep an eye on these te teachers well, it would have stopped one teacher that we tried to stop in my high school if he had a camera in his classroom and he didn't know about it <laughs> Ooh. That's, that's i mean no, again point. it's a double-edged sword i mean you don't want a big brother brother system However, um, it, again, if they're, if they're, I mean, luckily kids have phones, at least in the high school side mm -hmm. of things, and mm -hmm. you can record actions of that nature and, and tell the proper people and authorities of, of that situation. But I think it comes down to you can avoid cameras if the administration just does a better vetting of the teachers that they hire. And they understand that, like on, in schools, you don't really teach values you just teach the basic fundamentals the parents can teach the values and then as you as the kids get older they can learn through i mean if we if, if, if a school is lucky enough in a high school to have a philosophy class that's where you can really explore values and a good mm. philosophy teacher doesn't give answers it just constantly asks questions but the kids come to their own debates and come to their own theories and write their own thesis and all that other stuff so and then they're graded on that um that that's the sign of a, at least a good philosophy that's teacher. actually that was exactly my argument too is that why like why do this instead of actually being held accountable for who we hire like, like mm -hmm. shouldn't we just have better hiring practices and like actually understand that people were hiring like you know if they're if they're coming in and being like yeah this is what i'm gonna put in my curriculum and you're like yeah okay you're hired you know like Shouldn't people know that that's 
the, the person that they're hiring? Like, yeah, I like there was basic tells. Like if a 45 year old man with dyed blonde hair and a ponytail who likes <laughs> to wear bicycle shorts comes in to want to teach your class, you probably don't want to hire them. Exactly. <laughs> like it, but like it goes if that's back how they're going to show up for the interview, that's not a good idea. <laughs> it goes back though to what Teresa was saying about having to pay more if you're hiring more qualified teachers, if you're requiring um, higher standards to even become a teacher in the first place, then the pay is going to have to match that. And a lot of the schools and government generally just don't want to do that. Um, so that's part of it. In terms of the cameras in the classroom, I actually don't have a problem with that. I think that as a if I were a parent these days, like the way <laughs> are, I would absolutely want cameras in the class. That's the one thing I don't have a problem with. I don't have a problem with cameras. I mean, nothing being really of any concern should be happening in the classroom exactly. anyway. So, like, exactly. if anything, it'd be like, oh, if we we got we captured a recording of a fight breaking up, or maybe a fire started, or something of that nature. You have something to come at to. The other part too is you don't want someone to be live feed abusing that that system, or at least trying to pervert it and say we have to put cameras in the bathrooms now. It's like, no, you don't. Yeah, <laughs> it's a no. slippery slope, man. I don't yep. know. It's it's really weird. Like some perverted. Uh, you know, coach being like, I'm going to start putting the cameras in the girl's locker room and seeing the It's girl. mostly usually the men's shower room, actually, is what I've heard the, the stories oh. more often. Oh, God. Uh, yeah. John Burns, thank you so much for the $10, says the one I liked in Canada was don't just think about it. Do it, do it, do it, do it. Uh, it with a friend so that you can... <laughs> You can bend, do it for your feet. It's it's kind of neat. Do it for some action participation. Is that that guy? I think I remember that guy and his wife, right? The one that they would do the uh the Is that the body fit? Yeah, the body, body fit. Body break. Body yeah, break. Body yes. Break. Oh. Body break. Yes, that one. I love that guy. Body break was awesome. That family is weird. <laughs> but they had <laughs> they great, so like, weird. you know, commercial ads about staying fit. <laughs> oh my god. They were like the they were like on like crack, but like they were used way. as part of a marketing campaign for the Netflix show Santa Clarita Diet, and it was brilliant. Oh my god, really? I yeah, didn't, they were I eaten by that. by a zombie. <laughs> oh my god, that's hilarious. Um, Diego Flores, thank you so much for the five. Says, "What the hell did we just watch? What do they teach you up in there?" <laughs> Well, they told us not to put stuff in our mouth, and yeah. our, <laughs> they, they told it, it kind of worked. To, yeah, <laughs> they told me not to put it in my mouth, so I didn't. Um. <laughs> like, no, and you know, there's so many funny points where you could actually like be in a situation. Where it's like, well, you know what? There was a song I was taught as a kid that told me not to do that. Like, if you get pulled over and they say breath breathalyzer, like, listen, I gotta ask someone I love if I have to do this because the song told me as a kid. <laughs> Oh yeah. my God! What a gong show, Canada! I'm get yanked I, I... out of the car and arrested. <laughs> uh, John Brand says, "For two dollars, do it for your muscles. It will make the, make make them hustles." Yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure that's what you're talking about. <laughs> so funny. Uh, John Burns for another two cameras in the classroom for the uh, what? The turnos. The turnos. Oh. oh right. Okay. I, I, what is that? I think that was that teacher who molested one of their students. Yeah. Oh no. Uh, oh no. Yeah. That. See. That's the only. That's the only time I. I would ever. I guess consider that. I don't know. It's just such a such a slippery slope for me. I hate Big Brother, you guys. I Not hate Big Brother too. The thing but is, I mean, is that, it's here. Is it Big Brother in the home or is it Big Brother in public places? And that's that's kind of the thing that you got to kind of reconcile a little bit because Big Brother was actually in your home. Um, Considering the, the United States, is, they're they're in the home. Yeah. I mean, they're actually, everywhere. even today, yeah, through your phone and through your everything, they're laptops and they're smart everywhere. TVs. However, I still don't, I just still don't get customizable ads. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I get them anytime I'm thinking of something, it oh never pops up on my computer for me to buy. If I say a word, it will be on every device I own. <laughs> that used to happen to me until I turned off the all those uh, like you know listen to it and I opted out like on all, all the follow the my phone type of stuff. I don't yeah, even care anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I just want a discount. Hey, that would be good. <laughs> well, I was reading the other night that they were doing the, like the commercials in your dreams soon, and I was like, "That's transmental policy another, crap." This this bullshit. Because you guys remember that episode of Futurama <laughs> where they were doing yep. that? Oh, oh yeah, my God. Jane, just talk about coupons all the time. Maybe you'll get some deals. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Yeah, fifty percent off. 
Yeah. John Burns, thank you so much for the five. Says politicians should be followed around by twenty four seven. Mary Kay, uh, let whatever that name is. Laterno. Laterno. Thank you. Had two children. He fathered her first child when he was eleven. Oh God. And she oh. lived. See, this is the other thing too. I don't understand how child molesters live. Like she should have been dead. Like, somebody should have killed her. Uh, my husband thinks exactly like you. I I don't get it. No, no, no. I'm I'm. I didn't even know about this person until right now, you guys. I didn't even know. See, some of the stuff you're like, uh, uh like I would have been better off not knowing. <laughs> they, should, they should all be dead. Same theory. Uh, yeah. I mean, a lot of people share that point of view. I mean, I almost share that point of view. I don't really. I don't know. Is yeah, there I'm ever conflicted on back? that. Yeah, I'm, I'm conflicted on that because emotionally, it's like, yeah, I, I, I don't want them around anymore. But the other part's like, I'd really like them to be rehabilitated to the point where exactly. I know for sure they'd never do it. And exactly, script help, yeah. and maybe be able to identify and help people to to prevent that before a crime commits. I think but that's a perfect world it, that doesn't right. exist, right? Yeah. yeah. See, that's the thing. Like, you know, when it comes to stuff like that, I always think. Is there coming back? Like, is there a way a person can be rehabilitated from that? And that's something that I, like, you know, I always think about. But then it's, I don't know. Does man. it matter though? Well, yeah, because if you can be rehabilitated, that means. Like, but the child's not going to be rehabilitated. True, but if the process is perfect. For the rest of their life. No, no, no. But you're absolutely correct there. But if the process is perfected to the point where a person who may be understanding of that does twisted desire can seek the real rehabilitation before the crime's committed mm -hmm. and therefore you actually circumvent such an act of happening um but no i no you're absolutely right like after the crime has happened the, the damage has already been done and it's very 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 difficult to try and come up away from that i mean you just you just learn, learn to live with it as opposed to really overcoming it so it's it's not an ideal situation yeah it's definitely yeah i think not. for parents who decide to take action it should be a misdemeanor Actually, I, yeah, I, I, I kind of agree I with give, you. Yeah. And very like, strong things against it. like that. Uh, like that one guy in Texas who you know walked in on his daughter getting raped, and then mm -hmm. he like shot her or shot that guy. Uh, he got let go. Like it was nothing. We had know? a very famous case here, not it was maybe the eighties or nineties, where this guy's child had been kidnapped and raped by this guy. And um, the guy got arrested, got prosecuted. Uh, he was at the airport for some reason. I think they were bringing him, transporting him from one place to another. The press was there. And the father shot him dead in the airport in public on camera. And you can actually Ooh. still Google this. And uh, yeah, I think he got probation because Louisiana doesn't play that. That's a little harsh. They, couldn't, they didn't give him a parade or anything? They should have. They had wow. to give him something, so they figured, well, because he wow. did it on camera. Had he done it privately, it, it may have gone away. That's that's really, <laughs> I don't know what to say. That's that's crazy. I fucking hate how dark our world is sometimes. I'm like, uh, yeah. Like, well, the yeah. other part, too, is like what's like really this. sad is we know more about how the universe functions than we do the human body and mind. The mind, that's for sure. Uh, yeah. Definitely. But we can understand that more acutely. We probably would be able to circumvent a lot of these issues before they even happen. But the other part too is like, how do you circumvent it without robbing a person of their own agency? That's the other part that has to be. Yeah, that's at. like the minority report, right? right. Like you don't want to like, do thought crime shit. Yeah. 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 Uh, John Burns, thank you so much for the two dollars. Says rehabilitate and come back from it. Ask Bill Cosby. Um. <laughs> I don't think Bill that's Cosby did it to um like kids no they were all drugging his dates yeah. yeah they were all like they weren't consensual but they were you know over they were mixed years. actually there were some that was consensual but they still didn't get that opportunity to enjoy it because of what they imbibed right which is right. also which makes more of a worse crime because it could have been a lot of fun for both of them if you didn't use that thing <laughs> but, but 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 i'm just saying he they he wasn't doing it to underaged no people right no, like they were all yeah they were all they were, like I, I learned about this in college and it just broke my heart because it's like i grew up listening to bill cosby records and comedy and not so much That's watching the it. cosby show because it just just didn't it tickle my fancy there but it's like yeah i remember I, I, 
I never got into the Bill Cosby show because I always thought he was creepy. So I never watched I it. I love the Cosby show. I know you did, Jane. I'm sorry. So sad. I know. I'm so sorry. But anyways, we've had a great show. Thank you guys so much for joining me this evening. It was a fascinating discussion. And as Teresa said before she left, um, it needs to be had. We need to have these kind of discussions. It's not an easy discussion to be had. But um, I just wanted to like kind of talk about it. I'm passionate about it because I know I, 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 like I said, I've been a teacher and I've, uh, it's tough right now for kids. It's really tough. And it's even, it's really tough on parents. So I just wanted to maybe have this discussion, have, if people are going to watch this, share this out there with other people and uh, just try and, you know, be there for each other when it comes to that kind of stuff, help like your nieces and nephews and whatever, if you can, uh, as much as you can in person. And um, I don't know that do you guys have any final thoughts you want to share? Jane? Uh, no, I just I think it's at the end of the day, um, it's the parents responsibility mm -hmm. for the education of their children, whether it's picking the right school, monitoring what they're being taught, um, keeping in contact with teachers, just being involved from beginning to end, I think that's your responsibility. And the day you turn that over to government to make those decisions for you, um, don't be surprised when you end up with a child who is either uneducated entirely or educated in a way that's contradicting everything you taught them or everything you wished they had learned mm -hmm. uh, growing up. So just be vigilant and be involved is all I can say. That's very good advice. Uh, Script Doctor, what are your final thoughts? Um, get involved. That's that's the best thing you can do locally and in, uh, in your hometown. Learn the teachers that are teaching your kids. Um, it, it's going to be the hardest endeavor to undertake because life uh, gets in the way. But it's also very valuable because uh, what you really want is someone that can make you dinner at the age of eight. And that helps when you pay attention to them and are there to teach so you don't have to cook <laughs> amazing advice from script it's, it's a survival skill because then if you're not there they can at least feed themselves that's i do believe that you should teach your kids enough skills that they can make it by at least the age of 12 they should be able to to take care of themselves to some degree oh yeah yeah Oh yeah, I, I don't know if you guys ever seen that episode, uh, the, the anime um, Full Metal Alchemist. Uh, I'm I'm fully under the impression that you should definitely should throw like your 10, 12 year old kid out in the wild and have them like you know survive uh, by themselves. They should be able to hunt. They should be able to fish. They're gonna hunt and understand the cycle of life, and uh, you know that you're gonna die if you don't provide for yourself. <laughs> Oh, I mean, so think about sad. it. We have natural disasters here. Like, you know, yeah. things could happen and you can get separated from your kid. They should be able to have, read a map, you know, things like that. Yeah. And uh, like we have natural disasters all the time. I'm preparing for one tonight. It's supposed to be a hurricane. So that is mm. going to be an interesting, uh, interesting situation. John Burns, thank you so much for the five dollars as Cosby. There were almost two instances of alleged child abuse, mm. both involving girls 15 years of age. Oh, I had not heard I that. Didn't, I didn't know. That's. I haven't heard of those it. ones. I've heard of all the ones of the um, models that are like 1920, because that's what he gravitated towards. Too. Yeah, that's what I heard about too. Oh, that's so gross, John. Thanks for that info. Oh, bah. Okay. <laughs> John said Nina is a sink or swim kind of parent. <laughs> Yes, yes, I am. Yes, <laughs> yes. Or I would be if I was one. Um, so uh, again, thank you guys so very, very much. And I totally agree agree with Script Doctor. I actually say this all the time on Infinite Hope that happens on Fridays. Get involved, whatever that means for you. Get involved in your communities. Get involved with law enforcement. Get involved. Get to know your community around you. Because the more tight knit communities you build around you, the like you know, the more likely it is that people will come and help, and you can rely on each other. And 
uh, you know, you just build a network, right? Uh, so like, I always talk about that kind of that kind of stuff to uh, script doctor, uh, script, script doctor, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Tell everyone where they can find you. Oh, you can find me on Twitter at script doctor PhD. I have a YouTube channel in hiatus at the moment as I'm currently working on screenplays for, for money. So that's, that's fun. Um, but you can also find me here Sunday on Nina's channel. We'll be talking about the, the what if, uh, yes, what if number two, which is apparently like a number two, I haven't seen it yet. Um, mixed reviews. Yeah. Uh, I've heard really bad things so oh, far. It's terrible. <laughs> Jane, tell everyone where they can find you. You can find me here on YouTube where I post movie and television reviews and occasionally some pop culture commentary. You can also find me on Twitch, Twitter, and Instagram at Jane Theory. Yay. Thank you so much for joining Ooh. me. And Jane, uh, Jane and script and Teresa's information is all in the description, including the video that I shared at the start of this. Uh, so make sure you guys check that out as well. It's a great video on education and the education system. Uh, thank you all for joining me tonight and I'll see you Friday for infinite hope and I'll next Wednesday for another breaking the narrative. Uh, have a great night, you guys. Bye. Bye.